Welcome to a journey through the history of art. We will travel along a timeline from the caves to the 19th century. My name is Dr. Jean Willett. Let's begin by making the familiar unfamiliar. The word rococo was derived from the French name for shell, rocaille, and the style was seen as an extension and an elaboration of the Baroque. Known for its exaggeratedly decorative style, curvilinear forms, pale pastel colors, shimmering mirrored surfaces, feathery soft brushstrokes, the Rococo style was neglected by art historians who saw it as the last decadent gasp of the Baroque before neoclassicism restored a rational art form to its rightful place. Perhaps because many of the patrons of the Rococo artists were powerful women, Rococo art was dismissed as wallowing in the erotic, the frivolous, the feckless, so characteristic of the idle aristocracy. From the decorative panels of Boucher to the raunchy sexual innuendos of his pupil Fragonard, Rococo art seemed to be an art of excess, whether it was too many naked women or a surplus of ornamentation demonstrated in German architecture, hopelessly addicted to all things feminine and fatally attached to a doomed aristocracy. However, once we pull back from gender and class interpretations and ask our key questions, how did art function in society, what was the role of the artist, the 18th century ushered in significant changes in art. First, King Louis XIV had successfully established the dominance of France over the arts. Paris became the center of the art world, dominating designs in fashion, furniture, and the beaux-arts. Second, the French Academy ruled over the art world, trained the artist, ordered the arts into a hierarchy, relegating history painting to the top, landscape painting because of Poussin and Lorraine, a respectable second, trailed by portraiture and still lives. Third, although the Academy excluded women, many female artists became well-known, working for aristocrats, usually female patrons. Fourth, a new audience emerged from a new class, an in-between class between the aristocracy and the proletariat, the middle class, the bourgeoisie. This class formed a distinct art audience for middle class art with middle class themes. These paintings by Goers and Chardin, whose humble and homey scenes contrasted in their morality and sobriety to the frivolous fets of Watteau. Next, the state system of exhibiting art made by French artists, called salons after the large display rooms, were opened to the public. By 1730, an art public had come into being. Some, inspired by the art seen in the salons, dared to express an opinion in writing. And then the nemesis of the artist came into being, the art critic. Suddenly, the state-supported artists were accountable to the people of France, and independent artists had a chance to show their work publicly, whether in the annual salons or in the shops of art dealers. Previously, art had been in the service of the ruling powers. The lower classes were expected to look at art and learn. Art was didactic and propagandistic, upholding the position of the patron. Above all, art was public. What makes Rococo art different was that it was private. The Baroque grand manner was the official public style of the history painters. Rococo art was produced for the private boudoirs of an aristocrat or for the middle class home of a merchant. Because of the personal nature, Rococo art gives us a more intimate account of life in the 18th century. Chardin depicted the middle class taking its duties and responsibilities very seriously. Fragonard showed an aristocratic class out of touch with a world that was rapidly evolving, a world that would soon leave the aristocrats behind. All we have to do is look at this new kind of private art, so relevatory of class, economic, political differences, and know that a social revolution is inevitable, and that once again the role of the artist will change.